Welcome to the latest MS Here from the Experts webinar. The series is helping people better understand multiple sclerosis, highlights MS-related resources, plus provides tools and tips to navigate their MS journey with more knowledge and confidence. Our intention is to help you learn more about this disease, the treatments, research, wellness strategies, our programs, and much more. My name is Shauna McKinnon. I'm a veteran, uh, 25 years with multiple sclerosis, and I'm an, uh, an avid cyclist and hiker and walker. And if there's one thing that I tell people when they're newly diagnosed is to keep moving, if at all possible. If you can only move your little finger, keep it moving. I'm your moderator for today's broadcast. So I'm pretty excited about today's broadcast as well, staying active to enhance your physical wellness. Now, before we get into that, I wanna take this opportunity to share that as of January 1st past, there's been a name change and the society is now called MS Canada. Under this new name, we will continue to fulfill the mission rather of the MS Society of Canada and the MS Scientific Research Foundation, building upon our 75 year history of supporting the MS community and funding the most promising research to identify the cause and cure of MS, plus the development of new treatments. It is a new name, but it's easier to spell than society. Uh, but we do have the same vision as well of a world free of MS. Stay tuned because over the next few weeks and months, you're gonna hear more about the transition and you're gonna see changes which will include our visual presence, especially on social media, a refreshed website that will also be more user-friendly, plus incorporate more engagement opportunities for the MS community and new email addresses. Now, before we get started with the presentations, let's briefly go over a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, microphones have been muted, except for mine right now. They're gonna remain muted for the entirety of the broadcast. If you do have a question for one of today's panelists, you can type it into the chat box on the right of your screen, and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible following the formal presentation, although we have received some pre-submitted questions to help get us started. The session is being broadcast on Facebook Live, and we welcome that audience to also type any questions into their chat box. Please note that questions pertaining to specific personal situations likely cannot be answered in this type of venue, so we recommend contacting your personal MS healthcare team or perhaps contacting the MS Knowledge Network for those questions. The session is being recorded and it's going to be available soon on our website in English, and we're going to be adding French subtitles to the recording, but that version won't be available for several weeks. The recordings will be available on our website under Nationwide Webinars from the Archive page and on our YouTube channel, and a Facebook Live recording will also be available. Please note that the MS Society of Canada does not approve, endorse, or recommend any specific product, therapy, or service, but provides information to assist individuals in making their own health and wellness decisions. Today's broadcast is an opportunity to learn more about enhancing your physical wellness, which can help to enhance your quality of life, even when there may be some bumps in the road with your MS journey. Doing something is always better than doing nothing. So identifying realistic steps towards achieving your goals is crucial to your success. Now our expert today is Dr. Sarah Donkers. She's an assistant professor with the College of Medicine at the University of Saskatchewan. She's a physiotherapist turned researcher who specializes in neuro rehabilitation in addition to her clinical experience. Dr. Donkers has conducted numerous studies investigating interventions to promote improvements in walking, balanced mobility, physical activity levels, symptom management, and neuro recovery in MS. She's dedicated to improving the access to and quality of rehabilitation services for individuals living with MS. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much, Shauna. Um, and thank you to MS Canada for having me here. And thank you to all of you for being here. So today I am going to give a brief overview, essentially of the why, the what, and the how of being active with MS. Uh, so with the why, we'll talk about benefits of physical activity, essentially the why it's important to maintain a physically active lifestyle. With the what, we'll go over some terminology and uh, talk about different types of exercise. Then with the how, I'll end with some recommendations, tips, and of course, resources. Uh, so first off, I wanted to emphasize that um, the presentation title says physical activity to enhance physical wellness. Um, and the, the, the important thing to remember is that there are numerous benefits of being physically active in addition to just physical benefits. It's easy to focus on those physical benefits, right? Physical activity has physical benefits. And also many people living with MS, as you guys would know, experience physical concerns like weakness or muscle stiffness. Um, but it's important to recognize the comprehensive benefits of being physically active with MS. 
So benefits beyond the physical, improving coping, motivation, providing a sense of empowerment, control, improving mood, overall psychosocial well-being. Um, all of those are important components of living well with MS. So I like to think of comprehensive components of wellness. And uh, here, these are our comprehensive components of brain health because maintaining a physically active lifestyle can address many of these components. Um, so shown here is just one model or framework. This one comes from the Cleveland Clinic uh, and they emphasize that lifestyle, essentially our behaviors are what we do day to day, that our lifestyle has a profound effect on influencing brain health. So if you look at the image on the right, sort of as a clock, um, starting at 12 o'clock, that top icon, the dumb, dumbbell weight, uh, that represents physical activity. Uh, going around in a clockwise manner, the apple represents nutrition. There's medical health represented by the heart, the importance of sleep and relaxation recommended by the um, moon. And then the chess piece uh, highlights, or the, the, the night is a chess piece. It, meant, it highlights mental health and fitness. And then the speech bubbles are social interaction. So there's an interactive nature to, to these different pillars, but being physically active um, is important to many of the pillars. Uh, for example, it can help improve sleep and also um, our general health. So this includes two other frameworks, and um, I just wanna show them to emphasize that there is a general consensus on the critical role of healthy lifestyle behaviors in impacting um, brain health and your experience of living with a central nervous system condition. So uh, on the left here, you see again, exercise, nutrition, sleep, mental well-being, engaging in cognitively stimulating activities and maintaining social connectedness. So that was from a recent systematic review on the lifestyle factors affecting brain health. And then on the right, this comes from Harvard Medical physical activity, nutrition, sleep, stress management. They also emphasize mental fitness, positive relationships, and similar to the Cleveland Clinic, um, they emphasize the importance of medical and general health. Um, and so these different <coughs> models show that physical activity is emphasized as its own pillar, but also positively influences several other pillars. So there are numerous benefits to being physically active, and these benefits uh, go beyond just the physical. So one of the reasons uh, I emphasize benefits is it helps you with decision making, it helps with motivation, um, and it can also help with your, your goal setting because different types of activity and different intensities of activity um, have different benefits. So there's benefits in all forms, and these benefits can include um, obvious physical benefits such as improving muscle strength, range of motion, as well as fitness and body composition. There's also mobility, so ease and efficiency of movement. It helps maintain our ability to move, and that doesn't always mean walking. It could be transfers, um, rolling around in bed, um, getting up and off the, the floor or other surface surfaces. So. I like how Shauna said, move at any expense, even if it's your, your pinky finger. Um, I always say anything is better than nothing. And that's especially true for mobility. So finding little bouts of movement, even while you're sitting here listening to me, um, is beneficial on some level. Exercise, there's a lot of research showing the positive impact of exercise on symptom management, especially fatigue, pain, spasticity, um, I mentioned sleep already, some of the mood and emotional symptoms, it can help um, uh, how, how we're experiencing those things. The verdict is still out with the research in terms of the role of exercising cognitive impairments. So if you do have um, a cognitive impairment, exercise could potentially help your brain's capacity to, to cope with that impairment but we don't really know if it um, improves the, the impairment. But as I mentioned earlier, that uh, exercise does help 
with um, overall brain health. So other benefits, general health and comorbidities. I wanted to uh, make a point here that an exercise in addressing general health and comorbidities is important, um, especially because there's research showing that if you have a comorbidity, uh, such as heart disease or lung disease or diabetes, in addition to your multiple sclerosis, it can not only make your symptoms worse, but it can also uh, be correlated with loss of mobility faster and potential um, worsening of, of the MS disease course. So general health is really important. And uh, the good news is, is that exercise is a, a key component in um, maintaining healthy blood pressure, healthy body weight, uh, healthy cholesterol. Emphasizing again, the benefits beyond the physical, I mentioned already the sense of, of coping, um, control, and also a sense of empowerment in a condition that sometimes you might feel you have no control over because of the fluctuating nature of it. Uh, and in the long term, it can help you maintain independence and essentially um, that, that's what we care about, right? Um, allowing you or giving you opportunities to participate in your meaningful life tasks that have an influence on your quality of life. I get asked all the time, what is the role of exercising in disease-modifying therapy? Um, and with that, uh, I have to say the verdict is still out. <laughs> this is where a lot of the research is happening at the moment. Um, so most of the work that we do have on disease-modifying effects, so what is exercise actually doing to the MS disease process, to the uh, inflammation in the brain, to the autoimmune process in the brain. Most of the work we have to date comes from animal models. And yes, this looks promising. It's suggestive that uh, exercise can influence uh, disease progression and um, the rate of that disease progression. But there's a still a whole lot to be learned um, in human studies. And I will come back to that in a moment. Uh, so exercising is important, <laughs> but it's not easy. And we need to acknowledge what exercise can and cannot do. So exercise won't cure your MS and it won't eliminate or so get rid of your underlying neurological impairments, um, but it can positively influence your experience of living with MS. And it also improves your ability to best manage your MS. So it does have numerous benefits and it will help you live well despite your MS. So it does help us um, over time manage our symptoms, but in the, um, if you're starting a new program or if you're changing the intensity of your program in that acute short term, you might actually feel some temporary worsening of your symptoms. Um, and the reason I bring that up is that is common and uh, it's referred to as a pseudo uh, exacerbation or like a temporary worsening. And so having that in mind, it's important um, to gauge how long any symptom flare ups might last for and to plan for some rest after you've done about a physical activity. And um, I always talk about uh, having safety plans, right? So say you started your exercise program but by the end of it, maybe um, it's harder for your foot drop. Maybe when you're walking, you might catch your toe a little bit more. Um, you, you've worked your muscles hard, which are great to help with improvement, but it might temporarily have caused some, some fatigue or some local weakness. And so using a walking aid uh, to help keep you safe um, for those 30 minutes or, or up to two hours after exercise, while you're having your rest, uh, might be a great idea. So uh, just keeping in mind what exercise can and cannot do um, is important. We wanna be realistic, but we also wanna be motivated because there's lots of great evidence for why um, you should absolutely maintain a physically active lifestyle with MS. So this slide, if you, um, there's, there's a risk and the risk it's showing is the risk of premature death. What I wanna point out is between the, on the graph, 
between the first point and the second point, you see the steepest decrease in risk of premature death. And that is for people who are um, not currently active or um, do very little activity. So just by increasing your physical activity, a small amount um, can lead to, lead to dramatic improvements in, um, yeah, in your health, in your general health, which uh, can influence not only uh, quality of life, but also length of life. So uh, even little changes in physical activity can have a huge impact. And perhaps those who are more sedentary slash less, least active have the most to gain from uh, changing their fitness levels even a little. Uh, so I wanted to come back to this idea of um, the research going on now with regards to is exercise a disease modifying therapy? Um, there is a lot of research going on right now, and this research is trying to better understand the role of exercise in promoting remyelination, the role in preventing neurodegeneration. We're also looking at exercise as a primer for the nervous system. So if we can give um, you know, little bouts of high intensity aerobic activity, which has been shown to increase blood flow in the brain and sort of um, increase facilitation, so for the brain to learn, and then we pair that with uh, rehabilitation, um, do we get better outcomes? Uh, so yeah, we're exploring that priming role. Lots of research is looking at combination therapies, so drugs for remyelination or drugs for preventing neurodegeneration paired with exercise and other forms of rehabilitation, as well as neuromodulation with exercise. Um, so it's an interesting and exciting time in the research world, um, and this means we're going to have better answers soon in terms of dosage. So dosage is really um, what sort of amount do you need to get these different types of benefits. And if there is a dosage for disease modifying effect, when do we have to deliver it at what intensity um, and who, right? Who is going to best respond to that? So those are the things we're looking into now. And I hope to have, uh, you know, in the near future, more exciting results to share. So I'm going to move on to the what. So this is some terminology here. Uh, a lot of people use physical activity and exercise uh, interchangeably, and it's true that, that exercise is a type of physical activity. So physical activity, though, can be anything. Me sitting here waving my hands is essentially physical activity. So physical activity is any task we do that um, moves our body, that puts some sort of demand on the, the systems of our body. Physical activity has obviously a spectrum of intensities and a range of different activities. And just one of those at a higher, sort of more structured range is this exercise. So exercise is its own subcategory of physical activity. Um, and exercise just tends to be more structured. And we emphasize movements that are planned, they're repetitive, um, they're monitored, uh, we purposely try to increase or progress the challenge level you're working at so that we're continually um, stressing the different parts of the body to try and make gains. Um, so exercise, uh, often we talk about strength training or aerobic training. Um, resist, or sorry, resistance is a type of strength training, but mobility, flexibility, those are all types of exercise. Physical activity could be just things you do in your home, walking around the house every day, um, gardening, recreational, leisure activities. And emphasizing both exercise and physical activity are important um, to make sure that we're minimizing sedentary behavior. So um, sedentary behavior is any waking behavior that doesn't really burn much energy. So sitting still, uh, or lying down without much movement. And the reason we have to think about sedentary behavior is um, the amount of sitting we do in a day where we're not moving, because you can sit and be active, right? But if you're just like sitting and not moving, or especially sitting reclined and not holding your own body weight up, um, that amount of sedentary behavior can be its own additional risk factor for health and uh, lifespan. 
And there's research done specifically in people with MS that has shown if you have an increased sedentary behavior during your waking hours, it's associated with um, unhealthy medical factors such as increased blood pressure, but also decreased brain volume. So there's a lot of emphasis being put on not only exercise, but sprinkling bouts of physical activity um, in many different ways throughout your day and your daily routine so that you're building towards a, a less sedentary lifestyle or you're minimizing the bouts of long sedentary behaviors. So even just breaking up 30 minutes of sitting with a little bit of trying to sit up tall or arm boxing um, as a type of light physical activity has benefits. So I mentioned intensity um, across any type of physical activity and even within different structured exercise programs, um, how hard you're working can range from light, moderate, and vigorous. So even light physical activity has benefits over sedentary behavior. When you're doing structured exercise, um, so carving out a chunk of time in your day where you're intentionally challenging yourself a little harder than you usually would to try and get those, um, those fitness gains or those benefits, we typically want to work at more of a moderate pace. Um, if you are more able-bodied or less physically affected by your MS, and maybe if you are, you have a higher fitness level to start with, it is safe in, with multiple sclerosis to work at those higher intensities. Um, it's just a matter of listening to your body. And like I said, scheduling that rest afterwards if you need to, and knowing that in the short term, when you're starting a program, you might feel more tired, right? For week one and week two, while you're learning and your cardiovascular system and your uh, musculoskeletal system are, are building their capacity or getting better at responding um, to the demands you're putting on them. Um, uh, over time, you actually uh, get improvements in fatigue. So it is one of the best things we have to help with fatigue and uh, symptom management. Okay, so I mentioned types of exercise. This is the uh, typical list of structured exercise. Um, there's uh, aerobic training or cardiovascular training, and this is looking at uh, continuous bouts that are challenging how hard we're breathing and how hard our heart is pumping. And um, the general recommendations say, you know, you should be striving for uh, three to five bouts across a week of up to 30 minutes, but you can get benefits and if um, by just doing small little bouts of moderate to higher intensity activities. So even 30 seconds or building, um, you know, to one minute to two minutes and then taking a breath, breath and then repeating that, all of that is um, beneficial to your cardiovascular as well as your cardiometabolic system. Uh, when we talk about muscle strength, this is typically resistance training. It doesn't have to be fancy here. It can be fancy here. I mean, if you if you go to a gym, if you have weights at home, it can be fancy and that's that's good. But you're also getting benefits just by putting load through your muscles and putting load. At, when I'm saying load, I mean a resistance. Um, so grabbing a water bottle or a can of soup, even using your own body weight. So just by putting an added load through your muscle while you're contracting it or moving it through a range of motion um, has great benefits for both your musculoskeletal health, but as well as your um, neuromuscular connections and your brain pathways to your muscle connections. So emphasizing aerobic and muscle strength um, can help build the capacity uh, to maintain the, the functional movements uh, that we need uh, to do the meaningful life tasks you want to you want to stay a part of. Um, other components are flexibility, mobility, and what's often referred to as neuromotor, which is kind of coordination activities, balance or challenge, a coordination challenging activities. Brain games kind of fall into here because often they are challenging our neuromotor coordination. When we talk about flexibility, that is emphasizing um, increasing your muscle length, right? So if you want to work on flexibility over mobility, 
um, flexibility, you need to hold longer. So you want to look for a sense of um, a stretch in your muscle, and you really want to work on trying to hold that stretching sensation uh, for one to two minutes. Mobility is more about maintaining the range of motion that you already have. And it's really, really important with mobility to put your body and all your different body joints into positions um, that are out of your posture, postural habits that you're typically in during the day. Otherwise, we can lose mobility or range of motion in our joints without even knowing it. So what I mean by that is, um, you know, often uh, we all sit more, right, for a living now, especially with tech, especially past the pandemic when we're at home more. Um, but uh, if you're experiencing mobility challenges from your MS, um, you're definitely going to be sitting more. And just by sitting more, it pulls our body into flexion right? We tend to slouch, our shoulders roll forward, our spine rounds. And if you were just sitting like that every day, we are losing the mobility or the movement um, into the range of motion of extension. So just, I talked earlier about breaking up bouts of sedentary behavior. And a great way to do that while you're still sitting is just trying to sit up tall or setting an alarm for every 30 minutes. You're going to take 30 seconds and sit up as tall as you can. You're going to look up to the ceiling. You're going to open your chest and you're going to turn side to side because all you're doing here is focusing on your mobility, your movement. You're taking your joints through um, the range of motion they don't typically get to go through in a day. Um, okay, so styles and approaches. Uh, they, like such as yoga, Pilates, Tai Chi, um, they have several benefits. Uh, yoga itself um, doesn't mean you're just doing flexibility. You can go to um, challenging yoga, yoga classes that you're also getting resistance training through the body weight training. And maybe the intensity of that yoga um, is, is higher. So you're getting um, a good workout, you're getting your sweat on. So just because it's called yoga doesn't mean you're only gonna be doing flexibility. Um, and uh, same with Pilates. So these styles or approaches often cover multiple different domains of exercise. So they tend to be blended movement um, programs. And um, one thing that's nice about them is, is they also really emphasize a mind-body approach. So you're building body awareness, but you're also building mindfulness um, which has numerous benefits for, for our nervous system and just for uh, well-being overall. So that's a brief rundown of types of exercise. What type of exercise is best? <laughs> um, I'm sure you guys have heard this before, but at the end of the day, we can have all the research in the world saying, um, this is what you need to do for exercise to be a disease-modifying therapy or this is what you need to do to get a certain benefit. Knowing all of that does nothing unless it's something that you can do, right? Unless it's something that works for you and your body, it's something you can maintain consistently, that there is um, more benefits than um, challenges. So uh, what type of exercise is best? It's very, very individualized. Obviously, we are all individuals, but with MS specifically, because it's such a variable condition and how it manifests in each individual is, is quite unique, um, what is best for you is different than what is best for someone else. And at the end of the day, you're going to get the most benefit from an exercise program that you will do. Keep in mind that there's a range of benefits of all, at, in all. So if you hate sweating, um, that's too bad, but we'll try to find ways to get you uh, uh, cardiovascular or aerobic activity um, without sweating. Um, but there's lots of other types of exercises you can be doing. Uh, and I always tell people to consider their goals. We live in a day and an age when there's so much information at our fingertips. And sometimes it can be overwhelming, right? Um, Sometimes it can be very motivating and supportive to have all these recommendations, but there's only so many hours in the day and we can't fit everything in at, in at once. So 
carving out your priorities and your focuses for right now and know that living with MS, being active is a moving target, right? So what you're prioritizing day to day or over a week period um, will change. But at the end of the day, if you're keeping that mindset of um, it's important to minimize sedentary behavior and to try and build towards some structured exercise, um, then you're on the right path. Okay. So uh, the next few slides have a summary of some of the existing recommendations. Um, there's two really great guidelines that are uh, evidence-based, um, the Canadian Physical Activity Guidelines, and then a more recent uh, 2020 update that included some lifestyle uh, physical activity recommendations across the MS disease course. So that information is in here. But as I already mentioned, um, in addition to being aware of the benefits, and in addition to being aware of targets, it really comes down to um, where you are currently at, both in terms of your MS in general, or sorry, your MS um, in terms of, you know, what are your symptoms, what are their severity, and how have they manifested in your body? Because somebody might have one arm affected, and, and that's going to influence whether or not a certain movement causes you pain, or if a certain movement is um, giving you more benefit, right? Um, so it comes down to where you're currently at with your MS, but also your general uh, fitness. So if you were not active um, before, uh, you're going to be starting in a different place than if you have come with some sort of um, sports background or movement background. But like I said earlier, uh, you don't have to be an athlete. And quite frankly, you don't actually even have to like exercise to get benefits of being physically active right? So it's about considering your likes and really keeping in mind um, your whys, right? So I mentioned there's a 2020 guidelines, um, and I've included a few slides that summarize your targets. Targets can be um, a double-edged sword, right? Because you might look at them and be like, I'm never going to achieve that. Um, or you might look at them and be like, I'm already doing more than that right? Um, targets are good because they, they let us know what has been researched, what, what is safe. They let us know that exercise is safe in MS. And th again, they give you a target. They're a recommendation of, of either, um, you know, a minimal goal you need to work towards to get benefits or like an, an average goal um, once you have a level of fitness that you want to try and maintain. Um, but if you read some of these targets and you're just like, nope, <laughs> then that's not much use, right? Like it's demotivating. So uh, keep in mind that anything is better than nothing. It's not an all or none phenomenon. Um, so I've included the link here as well to our Canadian Physical Activity Guidelines, but both of them are, are um, you know, together emphasizing that in addition to minimizing sedentary behavior, you wanna try and build towards these um, bouts of structured exercise, especially uh, combining aerobic activity and resistance training for um, the biggest benefits. Uh, so this is from the 2020 guidelines. Um, I like that they separate some recommendations based on uh, how your MS is currently affecting you. Right. So if you are less physically affected by your MS, then um, really just focus on doing the things that you enjoy or exploring, taking the opportunities to explore things to challenge your aerobic system or your uh, musculoskeletal system. And making sure you're maintaining your flexibility and continuing to challenge your nervous system. So when I work with someone who's uh, newer diagnosed and um, perhaps uh, less physically affected by their MS, I am treating them essentially like an elite athlete. I want that nervous system to be sharp. I want them to be agile. I want to challenge their, their jumping, their balance, their reaction time. Um, we have a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun here. Um, and so I encourage you guys <laughs> to always have a lot of fun and find ways of moving that are fun. 
if you are more physically affected um, by your MS, um, then because of limited movement capacity, but also because of increased sedentary time, um, just by the nature of the disease course, it's important to focus on complications that could arise in the lungs, um, as well as contractures that could arise um, in the limbs. So we definitely tack on breathing exercises or respiratory training exercises. Uh, more time is focused on flexibility. We try to do aerobic activity still if we can, um, but often we're considering um, you know, balance concerns and tying in maybe some uh, upper limb movements. Um, and those were suggestions for structured exercise. Don't forget the added benefits of minimizing long bouts of sedentary behavior. So regardless of how your MS is currently affecting you, um, just try to find little ways to move throughout the day. Um, while you're exercising, you wanna stay hydrated. You wanna wear breathable clothing. Um, even if you don't suffer from fatigue or uh, heat sensitivity, there's some research to show that uh, exercising in a cool room or using pre-cooling techniques is beneficial for everybody with MS. Um, the research is hinting towards uh, being able to uh, exercise at a higher intensity for longer without taking as long to recover. Um, speaking of recovery, you want to do something that is challenging for you, but you also want to be able to repeat it again, right, within two days. So if you're doing a really challenging aerobic activity, if you're not able to do it again, so you do it on a Monday, if you're not able to do it again on a Wednesday or a Thursday, it means you probably went too hard, right? So challenging is good, but challenging so that we can recover, so that we can maintain consistency. It's not an all or none, right? You don't want to work so hard in one bout that then you're, you're sedentary for the next week. Um, and again, what's so challenging in MS is there's those day-to-day -day fluctuations. So just listen to your body. And um, I encourage everyone to keep a diary or use some sort of fitness tracker, right? What sort of heart rate was I working at um, on a scale of zero to 10? How was my fit fatigue or how was my um, um, pain or, or muscle stiffness, whatever your symptoms are. Uh, and then while you're exercising, consider safety. I mentioned already um, your movement performance and your reaction time might be slightly less um, after you've done a bout of exercise. So schedule in some rest. Um, use supports if you need to. The other thing to consider with safety uh, is um, if you do have balance concerns, set your environment up, <laughs> right? That you uh, have supports if you feel like you're gonna lose your balance, you're not gonna fall and hurt yourself, or you have a support that, that could help you. Okay, so those were tips for while you're doing a bout of exercise. These are uh, tips for approaching a physically active lifestyle um, overall. I mentioned already, it doesn't have to be fancy, right? There's so many things we can do at home. And there's been so many ideas that have come up since the pandemic when everyone was, was stuck at home. Um, that being said, it can be fancy. So if something fancy is gonna help you commit and it's gonna help you show up, then you do you. Um, but I encourage you to look for fun ways to increase physical activity around the home. Um, you can, you know, do mini squats while you're brushing your teeth. You can do um, some dancing while you're waiting for your toast to pop, right? Little fun bouts throughout the day. You have to have a variety of options. Um, and that's due to the fluctuating nature of MS. But I think also it's due to uh, not being bored, right? Um, variety is good in life. And when you can't get your plan in in a day, if you have a variety of options, you're still getting some physical activity in through the day. Find balance across the weeks. Like I said, it's a moving target. 
maybe you were very fatigued this week or you had a cold, that's fine. It's your rest week. So then don't just like dive right back in and overdo it the next week. But at the same time, don't not get back into activity, right? So try to uh, maintain that habit of being physically active. Consider ways you can monitor your frequency type and intensity. Just that process of, of keeping um, an activity diary or measuring the intensity of your symptoms um, can be empowering. And it also gives us a lot of information uh, that we can reflect on and self-monitor um, some of our behaviors and keep in mind that anything is better than nothing. The remaining slides share uh, a whole lot of resources. I know Carla's gonna talk about um, some of these. And uh, resources are important, <laughs> um, but again, they're only important if you um, know how to find them and find the right resources that are good for you. Um, and so I encourage everyone to take a, take a look through these because different resources will be appropriate uh, for different people. Uh, these are a list of our pre-recorded movement videos for our NeuroSask program. Um, and uh, I get asked a lot about um, individuals who are in a wheelchair, right? Our, our brains seem to be better at finding ways to be active if we can walk, I think, because we tend to um, see sports related to activity or, you know, walking just being an activity. Um, in a wheelchair, there's special considerations for your upper limb health and your shoulder health. Um, and there's also the addition of learning wheelchair related skills. So I've just included some specific resources on that. So be physically active, know that it's a safe and effective. Um, find ways to minimize your sedentary behavior uh, and base that on something you like. And don't be afraid to ask for help and have fun because the best program is one you will do. Informative presentation. Uh, now I'd like to introduce you to Carla Holton. She's an MS Canada staff member and she's joining the broadcast to give a brief highlight of the MS wellness programs that she manages. Thanks so much, Shauna. And thanks for all that great information, Dr. Donkers. Um, I'm just gonna highlight um, for uh, so our wellness offerings from MS Canada um, this evening. Um, and the first one I wanna touch on is the NeuroSAS program. Um, obviously without uh, Dr. Donkers and her team, um, this program wouldn't have come into fruition. So um, thank you to Dr. Donkers for being such an important part of that program because I know it's well loved by so many. Um, so NeuroSask is a Saskatchewan-led initiative through the University of Saskatchewan's College of Medicine in collaboration with um, MS Canada. Um, this was a program that was initiated by the, the needs um, during that pandemic. The NeuroSAS program offers a 30-minute uh, active portion every Tuesday and Thursday um, at 2 p.m. Saskatchewan time. And the active portion is a seated movement class led by a physiotherapist focused on alignment, um, seated postural control, body awareness, range of motion, uh, muscle activation, and some resistance training and bouts of cardio sprinkled throughout. On those Tuesdays following the active portion of the session, individuals are welcome to stay on and attend a stretching class. And this portion will help with a uh, range of motion, pain and spasticity management. Um, on the Thursday classes uh, following the 30 minute active portion, um, it's followed with a connect session. And this connect session is a really great opportunity for individuals to hear from uh, a wide variety of guest experts on health and wellness. So there's a variety of different topics that are hosted each week. Um, NeuroSask is a program that individuals can register for at any time. Um, there's not a set session and it can be used as a drop-in program. As uh, Dr. Donker said, you know, some weeks you're not able to make it. Um, this is a free online program and has been a really important part of our wellness offerings. And we're so pleased to have this uh, program as uh, part of our wellness portfolio. The next program that I'd like to share with you is Time at Home. Uh, Time is an acronym for Together in Movement and Exercise. Uh, in 2021, MS Canada, in partnership with Toronto Rehab, presented a virtual, offer, off, 
virtual exercise program. Uh, Time at Home is hosted twice a week with the help of our wonderful and amazing volunteer facilitators. The Time at Home program is a free online exercise program hosted on Zoom with an hour long, hour long exercise session followed by a half hour social. Um, the feedback that we receive about the exercise portion and that social is that um, it's a really wonderful space and that our volunteers have um, you know, provided a welcoming environment and there's a great way for individuals to connect after that exercise portion. Uh, working with clinical experts and researchers, the Time at Home virtual program was designed to closely replicate that in-person time program to ensure individuals were receiving those uh, similar benefits from the in-person program. MS Canada runs these sessions the, um, anywhere from six to 12 weeks, and each session has two levels. In the first half of the session, the level one video is shown, and then level two is then shown at the midpoint to allow participants to move on to that higher level challenge um, as they're ready for those tasks because they've you know participated in level one. In both level one and in the level two video, there's two separate challenges levels. So this allows participants to choose the level that suits their ability. Um, so individuals can choose um, the more challenging level or if they're not, you know, they need to go to the other level, that's fine too. Um, the current session right now is running until um, uh, June 20th, and so it is closed right now, but there is another session starting in the fall with um, our first session starting September 11th. So anyone who's interested um, in this program, you do have to register. So feel free to um, email the wellness uh, at mssociety.ca uh, email that you see at the screen um, and be happy to share that link with you as it, the registration opens. The next program um, I'd love to share with you is Yoga for Everyone. Um, this is another program that individuals um, can register through MS Canada. Um, this seated yoga program has been in our wellness um, offerings since 2021. Um, there is a current spring session that's running until June 16th. Um, and of course, this one also is a program that is closed for registration, um, but will be another program um, starting um, in the fall. And so that session will start September 15th. The one great thing about the Yoga for Everybody is that this program is kind of unique that um, if you aren't able to make it to the uh, free online session, um, you will receive a recording. So after the session, the recording is mailed out and that recording is accessible for one full week. So this is really great for those people who have a really busy schedule and want to do the yoga. However, the Fridays that it's, you know, on don't work for them. Um, or if you really enjoyed the session and you are the class and you want to do uh, the video again. So this is a really great one for that convenience um, for people who are busy or really enjoyed the class. And last but not least, um, please to share um, Spirit Club. So this is one of our newest offerings that um, MS Canada has. In August of 2022, um, we were pleased to announce our partnership with Spirit Club. Um, Spirit Club is based out of the United States and it is an online gym with a wide variety of different adapted exercise classes. The really great thing about Spirit Club is the fact that they have so many different options. So if you're someone who likes to have a wide variety, as Dr. Donker says, you know, sometimes that's important to have a wide variety. Um, there might be Zumba that you're enjoying or boxing or stretching or yoging. yoga. There's really something for everyone. Um, additionally, Spirit Club hosts live sessions as well. So when you go on to their website and you create that account, um, you can go on and you can join their live classes as well. They have a variety, sometimes two to three a day. Um, in many of the on-demand videos, there are three uh, ability levels. So they'll have a seated uh, full body, uh, seated upper body, or standing option, which allows those participants to decide which option that they would like to follow during the exercise class. Um, the classes typically last anywhere from 10 to 60 minutes, which is really great because it accommodates individual schedules or how they're feeling that day. Maybe they are a little bit more fatigued and aren't able to choose, you know, that high, that longer duration level. Um, the other cool thing about Spirit Club is they have a few different uh, language options. At this time, they offer English, Spanish and um, a uh, ASL. Um, in the months since Spirit Club has started, 
we've heard from individuals that um, they really appreciated the different variety and the opportunity to get active during any time of day. This is open 24-7. Um, to participate and to create an account um, with Spirit Club, an individual needs to register with MS Canada, and then they will have access free of charge to Spirit Club Online Gym. Um, the process is fairly user friendly, and once uh, an individual is registered, they'll receive those instructions on how to create their profile with Spirit Club. And the other wonderful thing is the staff at Spirit Club. So if someone's having difficulties creating that account, um, they're really great at assisting in getting uh, an individual set up. And the other really cool option with Spirit Club is our second option. So option one is the online gym, having access to all those on-demand videos. But the second option is our weekly um, class, which happens every Tuesday at noon Eastern time. So if you're registered for this class, you will receive your email with a Zoom link and you can attend that weekly online session. Registration for this class never closes and it's open until the end of the session. Um, each week, a new video is shown. So, you know, we may have for a few weeks, we may have yoga and then a couple for next couple weeks, we may have Zumba. Um, and these videos tend to be anywhere from 25 to 45 minutes long, um, except for in the case of gentle yoga, which usually tends to be um, about an hour in duration. And then individuals are welcome to stay on um, after their exercise portion um, for the half hour Spirit Club Social. Um, this class is facilitated by, again, some of our wonderful MS Canada volunteers and provides that wonderful opportunity for individuals to connect after the class. Um, so people can choose option one, the online gym, people can choose the class, uh, option two, or both. Um, so very excited to be able to offer um, all of these amazing wellness programs to our MS community. Um, Spirit Club um, is available to those individuals um, living in Canada, living with MS or an ally disease, as well as their family caregivers can register for the Spirit Club. So, and check out all their wonderful offerings or come to one of our uh, Tuesday classes. Um, so as you can see, we have some wonderful offerings with Spirit Club uh, helping us to round out what we've been able to offer um, to our MS community. Um, happy to um, take any uh, questions at the end as well. If anything pops up afterwards, uh, feel free to email that wellness at mscanada.ca and uh, we'd be happy to connect with you. I'm gonna direct us back to Shauna and thanks everyone for coming out this evening. Thanks very much, Carla, for highlighting those programs. And I think I'm going to be checking out a couple of them myself. We do have a couple of minutes left for a couple of questions. And so I'm going to get Dr. Donkers back on here. Um, I know that you mentioned, uh, and I could talk to you about this for hours. I find this all fascinating. Uh, you, you did mention about the um, so some of the research that's going on in exercise and uh, for people with MS. I'm wondering, do we have anything that shows the physiological benefits in the brain? Like, can we measure volume, uh, oxygen level improvements or connections to in white matter improving? Like, can we do any of that right now? Yeah, absolutely. And I do some of that um, in my lab. Uh, so uh, no measurement technique on its own is, is perfect. So we like to use a combination of techniques and uh, challenge with brain imaging is it's capturing typically uh, the, the anatomy or the structure of the nervous system. And we can't always capture the, um, the, the connections or the, the functioning necessarily in real time. Um, but in our lab, we use uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation. So we measure the, when we elicit a response in, uh, we do this for motor nerves, when we elicit a response, how long it takes to get to the motor nerve. So we measure what's called motor evoked potentials. And um, that is linked to, like you said, connectivity and white matter, white matter um, integrity. We also do uh, blood flow right? We have a functional near infrared spectroscopy um, or an FNIR as it's called. And we look at um, patterns and efficiency and changes of blood flow. Um, we use structural MRI and when we can, which is challenging because we don't always get access to our MRI machine, but when we can, we try to use functional MRI. 
Excellent. Uh, this is just going to prove once again that physical activity is not just good for the body, it's good for the brain and we have proof, right? A little it's, bit. Yeah, anyway. we do. And more to come. It's, it's so good for the brain. <laughs> Okay, uh, most of the questions that we've received have been pretty much covered in the uh, presentation by both yourself and Carla. Uh, one question though that was not, um, where does physio fit in, in the physical activity spectrum? Would that be considered yeah. physical activity? Absolutely, it depends what you're doing with your physio, right? Um, I meant to, to touch on that in types of exercise. So sometimes you'll be given uh, what's referred to as like a, a symptom management program or an impairment targeted program, like stretching for one specific joint or something to improve range of motion and pain in that joint. Um, those are important and uh, keeping those as part of your regular routine will help minimize barriers to being active and help with symptom management, but you shouldn't um, only do those, right? Uh, if, if that's all you can do, that's great. But in addition to those isolated movements or therapeutic activities, you really want to try and find ways to build in structured physical activity. And your physiotherapist can help you find a program that's right for you or help you design a program that's right for you. Um, and a really great physiotherapist is going to ensure that you're doing both and structure your exercise training around your meaningful functional um, goals. Excellent. Uh, kind of related, <clears throat> somebody uh, wants to know about uh, being in a wheelchair and, and although you did touch on this very briefly, uh, this person wants to know if you can get the same benefits from exercise if they are in a wheelchair and can only work out with their arms. Uh, absolutely, you can. Um, it's it is harder because our arms are smaller muscle groups. And also when you're in a wheelchair, you're using your arms so much through the day, right? Um, you're, you're using them for activities they weren't necessarily uh, designed for or prepared for, right? Just transferring in and out of a wheelchair. Um, so it's a fine balance between um, preparing those limbs and making sure they're not overused or tired. Uh, in, and also using them to get that cardio, metabolic, aerobic activity benefits. Um, there's so many great resources uh, for upper limb based aerobic training in a wheelchair that we borrow from spinal cord injury, that we can borrow from spinal cord injury. Um, yeah, and there's, there's great research on the benefits of even wheelchair based aerobic activity uh, for cardio metabolic health, uh, as well as brain health. Okay, one last question here. Uh, fitness coach versus physical therapist, who might be best to help modify exercise for people with MS? That really depends on, on who you're seeing, right? Um, which one maybe is more aware with multiple sclerosis and also which one has um, more time to, to spend with you to find out what's best for you. Uh, and I did a research project that combined the two. We used physical therapists as physical activity coaches and health behavior coaches um, to change physical activity levels in MS. So um, try out different ones because um, nowadays it's much less about what profession they were trained in and more about um, their clinical specialization right? And the uh, continuing education they've done, the people they've worked with and their approach. So ask questions of these people. Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Donkers. As we wrap up today's broadcast, we want to remind you about the MS Knowledge Network, which is staffed by trained navigators who provide consistent quality information and support. And you can connect by phone, email, or live chat through MS Canada's website. And you can know that the interactions are confidential. Uh, the information is trustworthy. Navigators can help you learn more about the programming and the resources that we offer. Plus, they can help you find other community or government supports and programs. And you can also get you, uh, or they can also get you signed up for the monthly MS Canada e-newsletter. So we would like you to be part of the MS community and encourage you to get involved with our programs, the services, the events, government relations, volunteer opportunities. These days, connecting with each other is more important than ever, and more information is available on the website, www.mssociety.ca. 
If you have questions or you need support for this webinar or any of the education activities, you can reach out to the education team by email to education at mscanada.ca. So on behalf of MS Canada, thanks for tuning in for today's webinar. Have a good night.